Now we finished the prophecy series I was doing on Sunday nights, but um, I had mentioned that I might do one more kind of a little, little bit of clarification. Uh, the, the sermon isn't dedicated to um, prophecy, but it's, it's an important aspect to understand. It's what people who, who want to uh, support a pre-tribulation doctrine of uh, you know, end times events will, will have to give an answer for what Matthew 24 says. I mean, Matthew 24, and we've gone through this already before, starts off with the disciples asking Jesus, basically, what's going to happen at the end of the world? You know, what's what's going to happen when you come back? What, what's it going to be like? What, you know, they say, specifically, he says, tell us, uh, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? They flat out ask him, and Jesus flat out answers them. And he just starts telling them, this is the way it's going to be. There's going to be wars, rumors of wars. You know, it's going to be this great tribulation and all this other, you know, everything else that goes along in between. And um, we have a rapture here. We have the, the angels gathering together the elect, right? And, and it's clearly a rapture. It's, cle you know, it's very clear what's going on here. It's very clear. It's after the tribulation. So w it, it's spelled out so clearly that, People who don't want to just accept what the Bible says very plainly and clearly because their head's screwed up around something else that they've already come to accept and they're not, you know, whatever the reasons are for, for supporting false doctrine, um, it doesn't really matter. They have to do something to now answer for this and try to explain away what these verses are talking about or who it's talking to. So one of the ways they do that is they say, oh, oh, see here, look, this is talking about the elect. And they, and they separate believers from the elect as two separate groups. And see, oh, oh, yeah, see, this isn't talking about Gentile believers. This isn't talking about us. This is talking about a different group of people called the elect. And what I'm going to teach tonight about is the elect. Who is, what is the Bible talking about in the elect? And specifically in this passage, because... Elect literally just means like chosen. I mean, we have elections. We elect officials, supposedly, right? I mean, that's, that's at least the theory. That's, that's what happens is that there's these people that run for office and, and elections are held. And what do people do? They cast their vote. They say, I'm supporting. I want this person to win. I am choosing this person to hold this office. I mean, that's an election. That's what you're doing. Again, supposedly, right? In theory, that's, that's what happens. But... Um, no reason to get into all the details of that. It's a very simple word, elect. It literally means chosen. It's, it's, you've been chosen in this, in this scenario by God. You're God's elect. You're God's chosen. Now, I'm not going to get into the Calvinism aspect of this because I've covered this in previous sermons recently. And to be honest with you, I, those sermons bore me. <laughs> I've gotten comments of people saying they like the videos where I put them up online and stuff, but I really loathe going through the, the, the doctrines because it, it really is just dry and anyhow. Um, don't get, don't let the, the term bother you. If you, I'm, I'm sure everyone here has heard Calvinistic doctrine where they believe that God picks and chooses people to just go to heaven and go to hell and, and, and all this other nonsense. And the only reason why the term elect would even bother anyone is because of this perverted doctrine that's being put out there anyways. And they, and they get your mind to think in a way that that's not really talking about anyways. So we, we have this tendency to, because we hear something so much, to, to start to question or maybe have a, a, a different um, understanding of what, of what the word means. I mean, elect means chosen. We're chosen of God. God's not willing that any should perish. God wants everyone to be saved. I believe that God has chosen everyone to be saved, but, but people choose themselves not to. God wants them to be saved. So through his foreknowledge, he knows who are chosen because he knows who's going to believe. And it, it works out very simply. It's not God making the choice for us in predetermining Who's going to be saved? It's God knowing everything in advance and just saying, okay, yeah, you're chosen to, you know, to be my people. And God chose, you know, the elect can be used to describe, you know, because the word just means chosen, he chose Abraham. He chose Isaac. He chose Jacob. He chose their seed to be the progenitors of Jesus Christ, right? So in that sense, yeah, they're chosen. He chose them to be the, the you know, the nation even, excuse me, if you will, the people that was going to deliver the word of God, 
that was going to proclaim the word of the Lord. So they're chosen. You can be chosen for different reasons. You're not chosen just to be saved and that there's no other way around it. You're chosen to be saved. You're chosen to be damned. That's the false interpretation of this. But that's about as much time as I want to spend discussing that, you know, that meaning and understanding of the word. Because we're going to look at the context here. And specifically, what I'm, what I'm preaching about is what is the context of Matthew 24. And we're going to find other references in the Old Testament that are going to support what I'm teaching tonight. But my first question would be to someone who, who supports a pre-trib doctrine and say, okay, if this is a rapture, because it clearly is, I mean, God reaping the earth of his elect, well, how many raptures are there, first of all? Because in 1 Corinthians, the Bible says that there's, there's three. There's Christ, the first fruits. After them, they that are Christ that is coming, and then cometh the end. Right? So where does this fall in? And then is there then a rapture for the Gentile believers? That the supposedly the non-elect. And where does that happen? And how does that factor in everything? And, and when you look at everything described in Matthew 24, we got the sun and moon being dark. Well, it can't be around the sun and moon being darkened because this is the elect. Right? It can't be, you, you have to fit it in there. Where are you going to do that? I haven't heard anyone explain where or when that happens because they don't have an answer because they're, they're wrongly understanding and, and believing in false doctrine. But anyhow, let's look at the elect because this is one of those terms that I mentioned this morning. It's one of those terms that can be understood differently based on the context. Just like repent. You have, to, you have to see the context and know what is it referring to. Who is it talking about? The elect. Well, let's start reading here again in Matthew 24, verse number 20. The Bible says, But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, at this time no nor ever shall be. The great tribulation. Verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So there's a great tribulation coming, where well, there's persecution coming upon, and, I mean, don't, don't get this wrong, believers being referred to as the elect. I mean, the Antichrist is not going to be going after and slaying and killing and, mar and, and creating martyrs of people who don't believe in Jesus Christ. What would be the point of that? The Bible never says anything about him going after physical Jews. So at this point, this is the elect, but these are the people being attacked and being killed for, for the cause of Christ. And then in verse 23, so, but it doesn't tell us specifically who the elect are, right? I mean, it's, just, it's the elect. Verse 23, uh, we, could, we could infer exactly what it means, but don't worry, we're going we're gonna to get a little bit more detailed here. Verse 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So now, again, the very elect. Elect is being used as a term. Well, who is this talking about? It's a group of people who, no matter what false Christ appears, they won't be deceived into thinking that that is Jesus Christ. That that is the second coming of Christ. Now, again, if we're going to say that the elect here are Jews, aren't the Jews looking for the Messiah for the first coming? They're not looking for Jesus Christ. They're looking for their Messiah. So why would they not be deceived by the Antichrist with all of his, his signs and wonders and everything else if they're not even looking for Jesus Christ. I mean, they're not even looking to the Bible. The Bible's telling us here what to expect. They're not looking at Matthew to know what to expect. They weren't listening to Jesus then, and they're not going to be listening to, to Jesus in the future. I mean, if, if, they're, if they're following their Judaism. So at the, very, at the very least, or at the very best for them, these have to be saved. If you want to call them Jews, I don't know why you call them Jews because in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. But these have got to be believers. One, they're being persecuted and the days are short. The persecution is shortened for the elect's sake, for the believers, for the people who are being persecuted. And then in 20, Matthew 24, 24, it says that 
they're not going to be deceived by the lying signs and wonders. So let's continue reading here. Verse number 25, behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall, shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 31, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, I've never heard anyone try to use this argument, but obviously the elect in Matthew 24, this is the same group of people. It's not like changing who the elect are at verse 22 and then at verse 24 and then at verse 31. Uh, I mean, I, if anyone believes that, I'm not even going to argue with that because that's ridiculous. When you do your standard reading of the text, it's obviously talking about the same group of people in every instance. It's talking about the, whoever the elect are. And we see here the elect being gathered together from the four winds. The angels are doing it. There's a sound of a trumpet. Again, this all lines up with rapture in other places of the Bible. It's consistent. So who are the elect? The word elect or a form of it, elect, election, is found only 27 times in the Bible. Now, there are other words found, and I didn't do the word study on everything else, you know, chosen or whatever, you know, other terms that you can use. But the term elect specifically, elect, election, elected, whatever, whatever form there is, is only found 27 times in the Bible. Now, we have three references right here. You have three references in Mark 13, the parallel passage to Matthew 24. So that's six in the whole Bible out of 27, just in this one instance. So... Don't worry, I'm not going to go through every instance. You could do that on your own to see who the elect talking about. And it changes. So the very first mention of the word elect is in Isaiah 40. Turn if you would to Isaiah. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Isaiah. Isaiah 42, just so you could see this. It's the first time the word uh, elect is used. Isaiah 42, verse number one. The Bible says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, he shall bring forth judgment. Je Elizabeth, shut your mouth. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now, Isaiah 42 continues on here. I, I don't have this in my notes, but if you continue on reading, this is talking about Jesus Christ. It says, He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. This is referenced in the New Testament talking about Jesus Christ. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isle shall wait for his law. So this elect verse, this, this reference to the word, uh, to, to the elect is talking about Jesus Christ himself. He's chosen. He is chosen of God, right? To be the son of God, to be the son of man, to go forth and bring salvation and he's going to judge the earth. This is a reference to Jesus Christ himself. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah 45, just a few, a few pages over. Isaiah 45. We're seeing another reference to the word elect. Like I said, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just want you to see that it's not necessarily talking about the same people every single time. So you can't just make a broad brush of every time this word appears in the Bible, it's always talking about whatever, whoever, right? Because what, the, what some people will try to tell you is that, oh, it says the elect, that's talking about the Jews. That's talking about Israel. Well, no. That's not necessarily the case. In Isaiah 42, it's clearly talking about Jesus Christ. Isaiah 45, look at verse number four. The Bible says, For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, thou, though thou hast not known me. And when you look at this again, you read the whole context, and specifically in this verse, I don't believe it's talking about a nation of Israel. This is all about the person Israel. That's why it's, it mentions Jacob, my servant, and Israel, mine elect. I've even called thee, singular, by thy name, singular. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast known me. He's referencing an individual man, Jacob, and then renaming him Israel because that's both are his name in the same verse. Jacob, Israel, mine elect. I've even called thee by thy name. 
all singular references. Not talking about a nation and then to one name, to one person. It's one man. It's one person. And Israel was elect, just as Abraham was elect, just as Isaac was elect, individually. They're chosen. They're chosen of God for specific purposes. Moses is elect. God has chosen people to do, some, to do various tasks, to do different things. They are God's elect. Uh, turn if you would to Isaiah 65. Now here's where we're going to see probably some of the, the, the best evidence, in my opinion, <clears throat> of an Old Testament reference using the word elect, showing, demonstrating, because this is a prophetic passage in Isaiah 65, showing that the elect in Matthew 24, because Matthew 24 is also prophetic, talking about future events, that it is not referring to physical children of Abraham or Jews. Okay, And we're going to see that, I think, even more clearly in Isaiah 65, that it's specifically not talking about that group of people as the elect when we're, when we're looking at Matthew 24. So look at Isaiah 65. We're going to start reading in verse number 9. The Bible says, and I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks in the valley of Achor, a place for the herds to lie down for my people that have sought me. Look at verse number 11. But ye, the audience, the people Isaiah is talking to, but ye are they that forsake the Lord that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. So we see him talking about, I'm going to bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains. I believe this is talking about the, the, the reign of Jesus Christ, his seed becoming over. Mine elect shall inherit it, inheriting the kingdom. But he's saying, but you, you are they that forsake the Lord talking to the then modern-day Jews of his time. You are those that forsake the Lord. You forget the holy mountain. You prepare a table for the truth. Verse number 12, Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. The, the children of Israel were constantly being rebuked with stuff like this. Read the Old Testament. Read the major prophets especially. Read Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and you're going to find that this was a common message to Israel at that time. They've forsaken God. They're not worshiping the Lord. And he's saying, look, I called and you didn't answer. And this phrase specifically, when I called, you did not answer, this is Proverbs 1. Look at Proverbs 1. When I called, you didn't hearken. Let's keep reading verse number 13. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. So now he's making a, a distinction between his servants, the servants of the Lord, and these people, which were the children of Israel. He said, my servants are going to eat. They're going to be filled. They're going to be satisfied. You're going to be hungry. He said, Behold, my servants shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart and shall howl for vexation of spirit. I'm going to pause here for just a second. You don't have to turn there, but this reminded me when I was reading this and studying for this of, of Luke 13. Um, you know, he's describing, hey, my servants, my people are going to eat and you're going to be cast out. You're going to be hungry. You're going to be through. You're not going to be enjoying all of the, the fruit and, and the abundance and the, the peace and the joy and everything with Jesus Christ because you're not a servant of the Lord, because you're not his elect, because you are not saved, because you did not believe in the Lord. And in Luke 13, 28, Jesus said, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. So there's going to be people from all nations coming, servants of the Lord coming and sitting down 
with Jesus Christ and eating with him at the table. And you're going to see Abraham and you're going to see Isaac and you're going to see Jacob and you're going to be thrust out. The very people that they thought that they were, were esteeming and following, they were not following at all. They thought they were following Moses. They weren't following Moses at all. They were sinners. They didn't put their faith in the Lord. They were trusting in their works. And he says, you're going to see all this stuff. There, I mean, this is the people he's describing like in Matthew 7. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out devils and done many wonderful works? This is that attitude. He says, no, you're going to be kicked out and you're going to be wondering like, how did I not make it in? And it's the same thing he's describing in Isaiah 65. See, my servants are going to eat. They're going to be from all over, all under the heaven. North, south, east, west, like Luke 13 said. They're going to be enjoying. They're going to be singing for joy of heart, but you're going to cry for sorrow of heart. Look at verse number 15 here. We're going to keep reading. Isaiah 65. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Again, just indicating this is talking about future events. I have created new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem. This is the new Jerusalem. I rejoice it and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. You see him referring to my people and they are distinct from the people he's talking to. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her nor the voice of crying. Clearly prophetic. Clearly talking about future events. Clearly talking to the children of Israel and clearly saying that you are not my servants. You're going to be cast out my servants who are going to be called by another name, which is what he said here in um, verse 15, and ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen, for the Lord shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. They're not going to be the Jews. His servants are going to be coming from whatever nation is bringing forth the fruits thereof. But they're going to be believers in the Lord and in Jesus Christ. I think when we read Isaiah 65 and compare it, because this is, again, it's talking about the end times. It's talking about a time really close to um, what's happening in Matthew 24. This is talking about, I think, very clearly showing that it's not, you know, it has nothing to do with them being Jews and that there's going to be another people. And in Matthew 24, he's calling him his elect, which are his servants, not talking about the group of people, the Jews. Turn if you to Romans chapter 11. We're going to see some more evidence now from the New Testament about the elect and the nation of Israel. We're going to see what the New Testament says about this. Because I think it's confirmed in the Old Testament just as much as in, in the New Testament, I think, is even clearer. It's even more clear than what we read. I'm applying Isaiah 65 to Matthew 24 just showing, hey, when you compare these two things, talking about the future events, in referring to the elect, that's not the Jews. It's not the physical, that's not the nation of Israel. Isaiah 65 was talking to the nation of Israel. Matthew 24, Jesus was talking to his disciples. He wasn't talking to the nation of Israel. He was talking to his disciples. Telling them what's going to happen and this is what's going to happen to you. Romans 11, look at verse number one. The Bible says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. So again, we have a reference here to God's people being of Israel. That's clear in verse number one. He says, because he said, you know, has God cast away his people? Well, God forbid. God didn't cast them all away because I'm an Israelite. That's what Paul's saying. Like, I'm of Israel, right? He didn't cast all of us away. Was Israel chosen of God? Yes. Were they his people? Yes. Has God cast away his people altogether? No. 
By and large, yes, but has he just cast, has he just completely done where there's nothing that anyone who's physically born of Israel can do about it? No, he hasn't done that. Because anybody who believes will be a servant and can be used of God. Now, is he using the nation of Israel? No. But they're not so far cast aside that nobody that was of the nation of Israel could be saved. And that's what he's saying here. So, you know, he hasn't cast away his people. Look, I'm an Israelite, I'm of the seed of Abraham, and I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 2, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So what he's, he's likening this to the time of Elijah where Elijah is just saying like, I'm alone. No one's left. And this is probably how the Apostle Paul felt because the Jews that were being converted to believing in Jesus Christ and actually worship the Lord were being scared into being silent by the Pharisees and the chief rulers and the people in power so that they wouldn't publicly really say much about it. So you only had a few people really causing a big stir at that time. But Paul knew better. He's like, no, 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 because he's been doing all this evangelism and soul winning. And he's like, I know that there's more than this. So this, just like it was in the days of Elijah, there may not be very many people lifting up their voice and shouting it from the rooftops as they ought to, but there's more than just a few people. You know, just like it was with Elijah, he said there's, there's, it's the same way now. God hasn't just completely cast off Israel altogether to where they're, they're damned and can't be saved. But he says it's according to the election of grace which is key. I mean, you're talking about the elect or the election. The election is according to grace. It's not according to works. It's not according to genealogy. Right. It's according to God's grace and, and his mercy is, is giving you a free gift of salvation. That's what it's according to. Anyone who's received grace is the elect. It's that simple. Verse number six, and if by grace, and is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, and is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. We saw that this morning. Verse number seven, what then? Israel, and look at this, this is an important distinction, understand. Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. Israel, are you talking about the nation there? Yes, he is. Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. New Testament, Romans chapter 11, Israel versus the election, the elect. Two different groups. Israel is not the elect. I'm trying to do the, the, the sign, the, the math sign, not, right? There's, you, have, you have equals with a bar through it. Not equal. Israel not equal to the elect in the New Testament, according to Romans chapter 11. Jesus was not talking about Israel as being the elect in Matthew chapter 24. Even if you want to say that, that Israel still was the elect when Jesus was alive, he's talking about future events, which I don't believe that anyways. I don't believe Israel was the elect at all. Any of the unbelieving Israel has never been the elect. When God was using them as his elect, there were still believers promoting God's word and delivering God's word, and he was using those prophets. I'll read most of these four. You could turn, if you would, to um, Romans chapter 9. But all throughout the New Testament, we're going to see, and I'm not going to belabor this too much. It's going to be a shorter sermon tonight. Um, it's a real simple point that I'm just driving home. But um, in Colossians 3, I mean, if you want to turn to you can. We're going to be going to Romans 9 in a little bit. We see that the church at Colossae, because that's what Colossians are, is sent to the church at, 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 in the city in, in Colossae, were referred to as being elect. Do you think that that church only consisted of the physical seed of Abraham among the Gentile nations? Of course not. And, and we're going to see this in multiple churches in the New Testament talking to these people as being elect. Verse number 9 of Colossians 3 says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, 
but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. He's calling them, the church, the Colossians, elect of God. Right. Saying, you have the new man because you're born again, because you're believers in Jesus Christ. And in Christ, there are none of these other. There is no Greek. There is no Jew. There is no circumcision or uncircumcision, bond or free. So Christ is all and in all. Christ is the one that brings us all together. And guess what? If you're in Christ, you're the elect of God. Amen. You're the chosen. 1 Thessalonians 1.4 says, no, and again, the church of Thessalonica, another Gentile nation, right? Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. In verse number four, as he's opening up his epistle to the Thessalonians, He's calling them, they're the election of God. They're chosen of God. Not Jews, not Israel. The church of Thessalonica. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers. Now, in those other references, you can say, oh, but he's still talking about the Jews. To the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. Strangers means foreigners. If they're a stranger to Peter, they're not a Jew. Because Peter was of the seed of Abraham. He's writing an epistle to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Verse 2 says, elect. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Why are they elect? Because they're believers in Jesus Christ. Because they've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's so, I mean, it, it, and look, do you notice how many times the word elect is coming up? I didn't go to all the references, but have you found one yet where it's just talking about the nation of Israel? You know what I mean? I mean, we're saying the elect. So they just want to say in this one passage, because it doesn't fit their false belief, oh yeah, that's talking about the Jews. That's talking about Israel. And, and where do you come up with that? Where's your evidence to support that? There is none. They're relying on people's ignorance and just not understanding what a word means. Yeah. That's ultimately what it boils down to. You read all 27 references to the word elect and no one's going to deceive you into thinking, oh, that must just be talking about Israel because it said elect. The word elect refers to Jesus Christ more than it refers to Israel as a nation. And it definitely refers to just believers more than anything. You're in Romans 9, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. The Apostle Paul had, had a great desire and a love for his physical brethren, for Jews. He cared about him. He wanted to see his people get saved. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think a lot of people have similar mentality. You know, uh, I, I have somewhat of a desire. To, I'm kind of a mutt, but <laughs> more than anything, I'm Latvian. I think it would be great to like see Latvian people. And if, I, and if I knew the language more and was, you know, knew more people over there, I'd care about it even more. See, if I had more relatives I was close with out there, I'd have much more of a desire to really want to make sure that they get the gospel. It's, it's family, right? And that's why when you're, when you're related to people, you know, whether you're Polish or German or whatever, you know, whatever nationality you have, right? You're going to want your kinsmen, according to the flesh, to be saved. The Apostle Paul is the same way. And, and he continued to try to reach them and he continued to get shut down and multiple times he's just like, fine, forget it. You guys can just go to hell. I'm going to the Gentiles. That was the type of attitude that he had you know, multiple times. He kept on going back because he cared about them, but it was the same response because they were just rejecting the Lord. They were rejecting Jesus. So he says, for I, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brother. I mean, Paul has this, has this desire where he's just like, I'm willing to sacrifice myself for you. If it would mean you guys all getting saved, I'll be accursed. 
It's a pretty strong statement. Moses made a, a similar statement. I think those are only two times where, where someone is, is willing to say, like, I'm willing to go to hell that you can all be saved. Pretty powerful. I want a lot of people to get saved. I can't say that I'd want to go and spend an eternity in hell to save other people. I mean, maybe my immediate family I would say that for. But that's, I mean, sorry, Latvia. <laughs> I'm just it's a strong statement to make strong statement to make and, uh, and he made that and, that and this is Paul's desire so he said you know a curse from Christ for my brethren my kingdom according to flesh verse number 4 who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises so all these things are absolutely true this was the benefit of being an Israelite, being of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, when he was delivering them. Look, which pertain to the adoption, right? They were given directly the message of salvation. They were, they, were, they were used by God. The glory, the covenants, God was making the covenants with Israel. He, he gave them the law and the service of God, the tabernacle, all the different things they do where they could worship, you know, the, the Levites and the, and the priests and, and everything they did in the service of God. And specifically, you couldn't be of Moab. You couldn't be, you know, like, like there's all these generations that would have to pass before you could even come in the service of the Lord. And he's saying, look, these people, like you were given such great things, uh, the, the service of, of God, the promises, all these things were given to Israelites. Which is all the more reason, I think, why Apostle Paul feels so so connected to him like hey look we've got we have all this stuff you have this great heritage from the lord get saved i mean believe it believe what was given to you verse number five whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh christ came i mean christ fulfilled these prophecies through the physical seed of abraham Who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Verse number six. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect. Look at this. And this is important. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Of means from. They're not all Israel, which are from, that are, that are descended from Israel. Physically descended from Israel. Verse number seven. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham. Again, physical seed. So directly descended from Abraham. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, the reason why he's saying in Isaac, it's not because, well, isn't Isaac Abraham's son? Yes, he is. It's not because there's something special physically. Oh, well, I'm physically descended from Isaac. And, and you know, people want to take this and say, oh, well, yeah, the seed of Abraham, Ishmael is the seed of Abraham too, right? So if you're physically descended from Ishmael versus Isaac, then that's the big problem. But it's not the physicalness of it. It's what it meant. Now, we, the Bible explains in Galatians uh, 3, talking about how it's an allegory. How Abraham had two sons. He had Ishmael, was the son of, of the bondwoman, and Isaac, the son, of, was free, right? And, and it's explaining, like, what it all means. And that Isaac was the child of promise. God promised him a son, when he wasn't getting that son, through the flesh, Abraham tried to fulfill that promise on his own without relying on God. And that's where Ishmael comes from. And that's the best that he could get is relying on himself through some handmaid, not his wife, having this son that was not the son that God promised to him. Isaac was the son that God promised him, and he had to just completely have faith that even when they're past age of having children, he's still able to have a child. God comes through with his promise. So all of that painted a picture. And it's the faith in God to fulfill his promise that makes you a child of God. That's what made Abraham a child of God. That's why he's, he's making the distinction between Isaac and Ishmael. It's not because of physically where they came from. It's to draw the greater understanding of 
One is a promise, the other one's of the flesh. And your best works and whatever you can do through your flesh is not good enough. It has to be by faith. It has to be of the promise. And then verse 8 says, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. God doesn't care if you physically were descended from God doesn't care if you physically were descended from Isaac. You know, just forget about Ishmael for a little bit. You're physically descended from Abraham through Isaac. That means nothing. He's saying you're not even a child just because you're physically descended from him. He says, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. The children of faith. Those are the ones that are counted for the seed. That's why he said, they're not all Israel, which are of Israel. From Israel. Descended physically from them. It doesn't matter. The Bible says God is able of these stones to raise up children in Abraham. That's what John the Baptist said. Right. Don't, don't think to say within yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For God's able these stones to raise up children seed unto Abraham. <clears throat> means nothing. God can take a rock and say, yeah, this is descended from Abraham. Create a person out of, you know, doesn't mean anything. Turn through to Ephesians chapter 2. We're almost done. Ephesians chapter 2. A little bit more supporting evidence on why Matthew 24 fits so perfectly with the elect being believers, being those of us who might still be alive and remain during the time of the Great Tribulation. That's talking about us, the elect. Because whether we're alive for that or not, we are elect right. through faith right. right now. So if we happen to be alive at the coming of Jesus Christ, we'll still be the elect. Ephesians 2, verse number 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So again, I mean, don't miss the, the in the flesh references. Girls, Elizabeth, sit over there in that chair and sit still. That ye being in time past, he's saying in times past, you were Gentiles in the flesh. Well, past tense, you, you, I mean, they still are Gentiles in the flesh, right? In time, but that's not how God considers them right now. So he says, in time past, you were Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called, so there's this big, you know, separation. The Jews, Israel, they're the circumcision. Everyone else is the uncircumcision. You're saying, you're the uncircumcision in the flesh made by hands. Right? And he's making a decision because the physical nation of Israel, even though they were circumcised, were not children of God. They, they, they separated themselves in that manner, but that was all symbolic anyways to show the circumcision of the heart that needs to be removed for your salvation. It has nothing to do with, with your salvation being physically uh, circumcised. Anyways, let's keep reading here. Verse number 12. That at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. So when you weren't saved, when you were without Christ, you were aliens, aliens being foreigners from the commonwealth of Israel, right? From being a member of the nation of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Yeah, you're lost when you don't have Jesus Christ as your savior. Verse 13, but now, now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Saying you were way out there, you were lost, you didn't have God in the world, but now, because you're believing in Jesus Christ, through his blood, you're made nigh, which is close. I mean, you're, you're right here. You're no longer a foreigner. You're no longer a stranger. You are right here in the middle because of Jesus Christ. Verse number 14, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Between who? The circumcision and uncircumcision. The physical seed of Abraham and, and the rest of the physical seed of the world. He's broken down that wall. There is no more separation there. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, 
for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access, we both have access, by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore, verse 19, now, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. You're no longer aliens. You're no longer a foreigner to the commonwealth of Israel. It says, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Why? Because they were believers. When they were unbelievers, they didn't have God in the world, they weren't a citizen. They were off in their, you know, Gentile nation, so to speak, unsaved, lost. But when they put their faith in Christ, Welcome to the commonwealth of Israel, my friend. You are one of us now. You used to be a foreigner, a stranger. Not anymore. Now you're one of us. And you know, that's the same picture that's, that is represented when a, when a person would physically like move to, to Israel and become an Israelite from another nation when they would believe on the Lord and would just be accepted. And the laws even said, hey, deal with a stranger the same way you deal with everybody else because they're accepted as being one of them, when they put their faith in the Lord. And it's the same way here. Verse number 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Matthew 21, it's the last place I'll have you turn. Matthew 21. It's clear who's chosen of God. It's clear who the children of Israel are in God's eyes, who he considers truly to be children of Abraham. Remember when Jesus said that when, when, the, when the people are arguing with him, the Pharisees and stuff, saying that we're not born of fornication, we're born of Abraham. You know, we're children of Abraham. And he's telling them, look, if you were of Abraham, you'd do the works of Abraham. If you're going to call yourself a child of someone, you'd be just like that person. He said, Abraham didn't go about seeking to kill me like you do. And he told him, you're of your father, the devil. Amen. And they were. He didn't care because he even, he even acknowledged, he's like, I know that you're the seed of Abraham, but like, you're not his children. I know that physically, yeah, you, you know, that, you descend from Abraham, but that's not what I'm looking at and that's not what I care about. That means nothing. That's right. What matters is that you don't believe and you're of your father, the devil. We get maligned by some people out there, Christians that will say, oh, you believe in replacement theology. Yes, I do. Absolutely. I do. I don't think there's anything, I don't think God's a respecter of persons. I think that, that God is done using the nation of Israel for, for the means that he was using them for all the way up until the time of Christ when Christ came and fulfilled all the prophecies that were delivered unto the Jews. Doesn't, doesn't need to use them anymore. And he, and he says, and in Matthew 21, he explains this of, of why Israel is no longer being used. Look at verse number 42, Matthew 21, verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. He's referring to himself. This is Jesus Christ speaking, referring to himself as being the chief cornerstone. And he was explaining to him, and he's saying, look, I'm saying this to you because the kingdom of God is going to be taken from you given to someone else. It's just like the, the husbandman, you know, he lets out his, his, his vineyard and they're not doing the work. And they're just, they're not doing the work for him. They're, they're killing the servants and stuff. He said, what's he have? Well, they're gonna, he's going to take it away from them and give it to someone else who's going to work in his field and do the job that he has for him to do. 
The nation of Israel stopped doing the work of the Lord. They stopped doing it. So what's he going to do? He's just going to keep, you know, he, he worked with them and worked with them and worked with them. And, and just like the, the, the story of the, the tree that's not bringing forth fruit, he dug about it. He dunged it. Right? Just saying, all right, we'll give it another chance. But you know what? After this, I'm done. And God finally said, I'm done. I'm done with the nation of Israel. They're not bringing forth fruit. You know, you can only have a lazy, non-working employee for so long that doesn't respect you, that doesn't listen to you, that's not obeying you before you just cut them loose and say, I'm done with you. And he's looking for other servants now. Who's going to work for me? And he doesn't care where it's coming from. Who's going to be the nation that's going to stand up and promote the word of the Lord? That's my servant. And we get the same... Um, Understanding that, um, you know, whatever nation is, is the one currently bringing forth the fruit. If, look, if you stop being productive for God, if you stop listening to him, if you stop doing the work, he'll find someone else to do it. It's not secure with anyone unless you're working for him. You keep working for him and he'll keep using you. You stop doing the work, watch out because... He cast, you know, he took the kingdom away from Israel, whom he used mightily. What's to say he wouldn't do that to any other group? Right. And then in Matthew 21, 45, I didn't read this, but um, I mean, in the context here, it says, and when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. I mean, that's who he was talking about. He said, look, the, the nation being taken away from you. The kingdom of God taken away from you. It's going to be given to someone else. Why does all this matter to me? I, I don't expect, I, I, know, I know everyone in here agrees with, the, with our eschatology or end times events. But it's not, it's not a pre-tribulation rapture. Well, one, I want to be able to strengthen you because understanding what elect means, being able to give an answer to someone else is important, but not just understanding the doctrine, because understanding the doctrine is important but also to rejoice in the fact that God has chosen us as believers, that we are elect, that you are elect. God's chosen you. That should give you, you know, a, a, a good feeling. That should, that should make you feel loved and, and, and appreciate God. Well, wow, God, you chose me. I'm elect. You've chosen me just because I put my faith in Christ? Yes. And praise God for that. That's awesome. And, that, and you ought to remember Hey, let's try now to live up to our end of what God has for us. What did he choose you for? As we saw in Ephesians 2, 12, he's chosen us, to, you know, he's created us unto good works. Let's do the good works. Let's, I mean, acknowledge and be thankful. God, thank you for choosing me. But with that, let's turn around and say, okay, well, God's chosen me. I'm not, I don't want to let God down. Let's roll up our sleeves. Let's do something for the Lord. He's entrusted you. He's entrusted you with the gospel. The same gospel you received when you got saved. It's been entrusted unto you to bring that out to, to other people. I love this verse. I, I heard a preacher preach on this verse one time and it's really, it's stuck with me ever since. Um, I, I said, you don't have to turn there because I already told you this. The last place I have you turn was Matthew 21. But in Hebrews chapter two, verse 11, the Bible says, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. That's pretty enormous right there. He that sanctifieth. Who's he that sanctifieth? Jesus. And they who are sanctified, us, are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. For that purpose, God, because we're sanctified together with Jesus Christ, he's not even ashamed. I mean, think about that. Jesus isn't ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Let's live in a way that Jesus is not going to be ashamed to call us brethren. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's amazing in the, you know, us being sinners as we are for Jesus to, to be associated as a brother with us. It's incredible. But let's not be that brother. <laughs> you 
You know who I'm talking about. Let's not be that one. Let's not be a vessel unto dishonor. Be a vessel unto honor. And recognize, say, Jesus, if Jesus is willing to call himself my brother, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? I don't want to bring down the name of my brother and Savior and Lord. We're the elect. Praise God. As far as I've ordered prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for loving us tremendously, dear Lord, and, and for so much that you've bestowed upon us, Lord. It's, it's, it's really unimaginable um, how much you've done for us and and. and, and the endearing terminology you even use in the Bible, calling us brethren and, and um, just, just loving us tremendously, dear God. I pray that you would please help us to, to get a full understanding and comprehension of this, dear Lord, and that you'd help us to, um, to not let you down, to, to be strong, to, um, to not fail you, but that, that we could do the work that you're seeking to, be, to have done. And that we can bring forth the fruits of, of the, the gospel that you've given unto us so freely. Help us to prioritize our lives. Help us to, to be motivated to make the time to preach your word and to, and to do the work, dear Lord. We don't want it taken away from us. We want to be able to be used by you. And um, we're here this evening because we love you and, and we want you to show us the right way, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.